Good morning, this is Radio Good News. The goal of this program is to draw all people to the love of Jesus Christ. I want everyone to know and experience the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are key to a Holy Spirit-filled and successful Christian life. I will focus on God's love because God's love is wonderful. I'm John Thornton. I'll be reading from the Bible, the New Revised Standard Version, because that is God's word to us in our modern English language. Let's start today with Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard yet. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Those are God's words from Psalm 19. Our musical guest today is Soul Purpose. Oh God, you are my God. And I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God. And I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God. And I will ever praise you. And I will seek you.
my step you'll lead me and I will follow you all of my days. That was Soul Purpose. We'll hear from them again at the end of the program. Stay tuned for that. Turn with me as we again look to the Ten Commandments from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 6 through 21. Here God's own finger wrote, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or female slave or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the resident alien in your towns, so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God commanded you, so that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not kill. Neither shall you commit adultery. Neither shall you steal. Neither shall you bear false witness against your neighbor. Neither shall you covet your neighbor's wife. Neither shall you desire your neighbor's house or field or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Those are God's words, the Ten Commandments from Deuteronomy 5, 6 through 21. There were three old widow sisters, and the oldest was 96, the middle sister was 94, and the youngest was 92. They had lived out their lives and outlived their husbands and were now sharing a small house. The oldest sister went up to the bathroom and paused. She then forgot whether she was going into the bathroom or just coming out. So she called down and said, Sisters, I'm in the bathroom and I do not remember whether I just came in or if I was leaving. Will you help me? The middle sister responded and said, Oh, you are so forgetful. I will be up to help you. So the middle sister started climbing the stairs, and as her rheumatism was acting up, she paused in the middle of the stairway. She then stated, Oh my, sisters, I'm in the middle of the stairs, and I forgot, was I coming up or was I going down? The youngest sister was sitting having tea and crumpets, and she heard that predicament of her sisters. So she said, Oh, sisters, you are both so very forgetful. I will be up in a moment to help you. I sure pray that I never get that forgetful knock on wood. Oh, sisters, I'll be up to help you as soon as I see who is knocking at the door. Have we forgotten what God's own finger wrote in stone? Have we forgotten God's Ten Commandments? Do you remember? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. Today we have progressed to the commandment, you shall not bear false witness. In simple verse, this means don't lie. So when your great aunt Agatha comes to visit and she has that most hideously ugly new hat, you must not lie about it. Oh, sure, you are in a bind when Great Aunt Agatha says to you, What do you think about my new hat? You must not lie, but also, you must not be cruel. So be diplomatic, not rude. Say something like, Oh, how interesting. Tell me more about your hat. Do not lie. 
If she really forces the issue, tell her something like, well, it would not have been my choice. And here we see a conundrum in God's commandment. You shall not lie. Does there ever come a time when avoiding the truth is the best? Well, let's look to the scriptures and see what God tells us about being people of the truth. For God's own finger wrote in stone, you shall not bear false witness. Let us start with the power of words. Words are amazingly powerful. In James chapter 3, verses 2 through 12, we read, For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so very large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a rather small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Do you hear the metaphors for our words? They are powerful. Words are like fire that rages and consumes. That is how lies are as well, like fire. An old poem was penned about the power that comes from lies and from the tongue. The boneless tongue, so small and weak, can crush and kill, declares the Greek. The tongue destroys a greater horde, the Turk asserts, than does the sword. The Persian saying wisely said, a lying tongue and you'll soon be dead. Or it sometimes takes this form instead. Don't let your tongue cut off your head. The tongue can speak a word whose speed say the Chinese, outstrips the steed. The Arab sages said in part, the tongue's great storehouse is the heart. From Hebrew was the maxim sprung, your feet may slip, but never your tongue. A small stream of gossip poured in the ear becomes a cataract of lies for all to hear. The sacred writer crowns the whole. To keep one's tongue does keep the soul. So how will you use your tongue? Will it be for truth or for lies? God wrote the commandment, you shall not bear false witness. When I was a little boy, I was rather wild natured. My poor mom had to deal with all my energies and my amazing ability to get into mischief. We had a beautiful home since my dad was an excellent carpenter and contractor. And part of our home was this huge covered patio. I knew every inch of that patio. And one part of that patio was very fascinating to me. I was about eight years old, and that one part of the patio interested me. It was a smooth and flat part of the wall which was painted white. It was shaped like a window well and window. But since it was painted white, I could not imagine what it really was. So in my eagerness to learn and satisfy my curiosity, I wanted to learn what was beyond that painted window. I could not see through it, so I figured, I'd better just scrape off some of the paint and look through that window. I squatted down and started to rub at that paint and my mind was imagining all sorts of things that lay beyond that window. Maybe it was a magic window. Would I be able to see some make-believe maybe land? But as I rubbed that painted window, nothing came off. My nails were not hard enough. I needed something metal. And then I thought that the end of the hose was metal. I could scrape off that paint with the end of the hose. So I went and got the hose and started to use the end of it to scrape off the paint. Well, that went along for a few moments, but the paint would not come off. So I tried harder and harder, and I was pushing at the paint with all my might when, 
crack. The window broke. I was surprised. I looked through that broken window and saw just some wood. I was about two inches away. The whole window was blocked up with wood. I could not see anything except that small section of space between the window and the wood. So now in my boyish mind, I began to wonder, hmm, how much water will that space hold? It's a small space between the window and the wood, and I have this hose right here in my hand. Oh, I wonder how much water will that hold? So I turned on the faucet and put the end of the hose through that broken window. I expected the space to fill up quickly, but it did not. The hose ran and ran and ran, and water gushed into that space for a long time. I wondered where it was all going. But since it never filled up, I got bored with my experiment. I turned off the hose and wandered to my next adventure. Later, I went downstairs to play in the basement. <laughs> and lo and behold, my mother was on her knees mopping up the floor. I found the water. It was all over the finished basement floor. Amazing. Well, I was faced with the hard fact that I had flooded the basement. I needed to tell the truth, but it was scary. I looked at mom and could see that she was rather angry. I could have made up some story. I could have lied. I distinctly recall feeling that temptation to make up a story and avoid the truth. But I told my mom what I did. To this day, I vividly remember seeing my mom's face fall as she realized that it was I who had caused all her work. Seeing that look on her face was more than I needed. I will never forget it. But she loved me anyway. She thanked me for telling the truth. <laughs> Amazing. God wrote us a love letter in those ancient stone tablets. God said, you shall not bear false witness. God knows that the truth is the best way to live, even when it means, means admitting you made a mistake. In Proverbs 12, verse 17, we read, Whoever speaks the truth gives an honest evidence, but a false witness speaks deceitfully. In 3 John, we hear much about the truth. As I read that short letter to you, listen carefully to how important the truth is. 3 John, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health, just as it is with your soul. I was overjoyed when some of the friends arrived and testified to your faithfulness to the truth, namely, how you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the friends, even though they are strangers to you. They have testified to your love before the church, you will do well to send them on in a manner worthy of God, for they began their journey for the sake of Christ, accepting no support from unbelievers. Therefore, we ought to support such people so that we may become co-workers with the truth. I have written something to the church, but uh, Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing in spreading false charges against us. And not content with those charges, he refuses to welcome the friends and even prevents those who want to do so and expels them from the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but imitate what is good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Everyone has testified favorably about Demetrius, and so has the truth itself. We also testify for him and you know that our testimony is true. I have much to write you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. Instead, I hope to see you soon, and we will talk together face to face. Peace to you. The friends send you their greetings. Greet the friends there each by name. That was Third John. God said, you shall not bear false witness. We need to be true. Part of living out that commandment is being honest in our witness. If you are a Christian, then you have been washed and made clean in your soul. You are a new and pure creation. You are white as snow and clean and pure. But would anyone know that by the way you live? Is your witness being honest and true? Or are you living life like an Oreo cookie? Do you like Oreo cookies? I do. They're very, very tasty, but Christians should never live like Oreo cookies. We cannot be pure and white on the inside and all black on the outside. 
We cannot forget that God called us to live a holy and righteous life. We need to have our outward behaviors match our inner nature. We need to let Jesus shine forth from the soul he has washed so that we can become light to a dying world. Kind of like a light bulb. We're the light bulb and Jesus is the electricity that lights us up. It comes from the inside out. Indeed, it is a lie when Christians live like Oreo cookies. Have you heard that there's a new denomination around? The Jehovah's Bystanders? People who are witnesses but refuse to get involved? We don't want to be like that. For it's also a lie when people live the opposite way, the way that the Pharisees lived. They lived out lies. They were false witnesses. They were opposites of Oreo cookies. They were all clean and white on the outside, but were filled with corruption and blackness on the inside. In Matthew 23, 27, we read Jesus' words. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are full of the bones of the dead and of all kinds of filth. So we must be true in our witness to the world. We must shine forth as wonderful examples of God's pure love. And that means we must be people of the truth. We must reject lies. In the book, The Brothers Karamazov, Karamazov, hard word, sorry, by Dostoevsky, also a very hard name to say, but he writes about lying in that excellent book. And he says, the important thing is to stop lying to yourself. A man who lies to himself and believes his own lies becomes unable to recognize the truth, either in himself or in anyone else. And he ends up losing respect for himself and for others. When he has no respect for anyone, he can no longer love. And in order to divert himself, having no love in him, he yields to his impulses, indulges in the lowest forms of pleasure, and behaves in the end like an animal in satisfying his vices. And it all comes from lying, lying to others and to yourself. Indeed, lying hurts yourself more than it hurts anyone else and far more than it helps you. Consider for a moment, if you were given a dime for every good deed that you did and were fined a nickel for every evil thing you did, would you be a rich person or would you be very poor? In Acts chapter 5, we read about a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira. Together they decided that lying would benefit them, so they sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, Ananias kept back some of the proceeds and brought only part of the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. He lied, and he claimed it was the whole amount. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now when Ananias heard those words, God struck him dead. Later, after about three hours, Sapphira came in. She did not know what had happened to Ananias, and Peter said to her, Tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. See, she got a chance to tell the truth. But she said, Yes, that was the price. Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately, Sapphira was struck dead. Yes, lying will hurt you terribly. Hear the wisdom from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 11, verse 1. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but an accurate weight is his delight. Proverbs 12, 17, whoever speaks the truth gives honest evidence, but a false witness speaks deceitfully. Proverbs 16, 11, honest balances and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. And Proverbs 24, 26, one who gives an honest answer gives a kiss on the lips. So are you forgetful that we need to be people of the truth? Have you forgotten who you are? Are you just passing through life lying to yourself? Or are you willing to live for the truth 
And the truth is, God gave us a love letter that said, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. I am John Thornton. Thank you for listening to Radio Good News. I encourage you to seek out a church family where you can worship, be encouraged, and live as people of the truth. For this area offers many fine Bible-believing and teaching churches of various denominations. You can write to me at Radio Good News, P.O. Box 1722, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57101. And I'm looking for people who want to be a faithful 50, people who want to support Radio Good News by buying airtime. Write to me and I'll tell you more about that. May you richly know the blessings of the God who was, the God who is, and the God who is to come again. And always remember, the Bible says love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So love Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind, and love your neighbors as yourselves. And remember, even though it's very, very difficult, we as Christians are even commanded to love our enemies. We'll finish today with a group from Omaha called Soul Purpose. Lift your name on